Uh, thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and, and you're absolutely right. These are microscopic slides here on the, uh, on the thing. So I'm going to tell you about adoptive T cell therapy, and, and you heard a little bit about selective uh, medicine. Well, this is really selective medicine because we're, we're now going to be uh, actually picking the antigen and giving a living therapy. So uh, these are my disclosures. I have uh, I've, I have research funding from both Juno and uh, Kite uh, who are in this uh, field. So here's a couple questions. Which are the following major complications of CD19-directed therapy? Cytokine release syndrome, uh, nausea, vomiting, neurotoxicity, elevated CNS cell counts are one and three. So just keep this in mind uh, going forward. Here's another one. What is not commonly associated with cytokine release syndrome? And there's fever, hypotension, consumptive uh, coagulopathy, uh, respiratory failure, or elevated serum ferritin. And I will talk about each of these. And a third one, what of, which is the following medications can completely, essentially rapidly reverse the hypotension and fever associated with cytokine release syndrome? These are, some of these are common, like dexamethasone, antibiotics, transfusions, FFP, Placement or tocilizumab. And then fourth question, which can reverse the neurotoxicity associated with CAR T cells? Okay, you heard about T cells. T cells work by uh, engaging the T cell receptor. So what's different about the T cell receptor? The T cell receptor does not represent, does not attack a target that's a cell, a cell express target. It, it attacks a peptide from a mutation that's expressed on the surface of the tumor cell in the context of HLA. So to use a T cell receptor targeted uh, T cell, you actually have to transfer in the T cell and that T cell then can recognize these targets. What's a CAR? A CAR is different. A CAR is a T cell that now has a gene put into it that recognizes an external antigen on the, on the tumor cell by way of an antibody. So, so a CAR cell or a CAR T cell, chimeric antigen receptor T cell, is really an immortalized antibody that can really kill everything it can bind to. So you're now making rituximab or HER2 or whatever you want to use and it's an antibody into a, a living uh, serial killer that can attack the antigen. And it's very effective. So any off-target effects of the antibody now come back to bite you because this, it, it, you have to have a very specific tumor target to not get into, not, not get into trouble. And I'm gonna show you mostly data with CD19 today because that's where all the action is and that's where the first approval for this product is gonna be later this month for likely for childhood ALL and adult ALL by Novartis to be followed by Kite for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma later probably by, by September and then several other companies to follow. And there's many trials going on. We're now also getting this into solid cancers and we have a trial on lung cancer and breast cancer targeting an antigen called WAR1. And we're just getting that started right now. But I'm gonna really focus on lymphoma because that's where all the, the current excitement is. So what are those considerations? The first thing is, the, it, the key thing about CAR T cells is the antibody. And it's, it's, it's a single chain FV is the portion of the antibody we're using. And that's the antibody that binds to the antigen. And the specificity and the target expression is critical because off tumor target expression can lead to toxicity. The other point is that non human or non humanized single chain FVs can be actually immunogenic, and your immune system can recognize a CAR and reject the CAR. You get T cells that kill your. T cells because they're recognizing the single chain FE, <clears throat> excuse me, the single chain FE is foreign and those cells can actually be rejected. Now, the other thing that's important about the CAR is that when you just put an antibody molecule stuck to a T cell receptor and put it in a T cell, it doesn't work very well. But if you put a co stimulatory domain, either with 41BB or CD28, then these T cells get a second signal and they can explode and when they recognize tum tumor antigen and expand. A, for a third thing is the what cell types are you putting the CAR into? And you've heard a lot about the, some of the types of T cells including CD4 cells, CD8 cells, or helper and killer cells, and also memory cells, or T cells, central memory cells. 
So that's important. And it's also important to remember that every product out there is different. They're not the same. They can have similar types of toxicities, but they're, each one is different. That includes how the cells are grown, what the cells are, what they're exposed to in, in the cultures when they're being uh, grown, and what kind of patients they, they come from. So just because someone says car, it's that you, you, you have to understand it's, it's, it's uh, product specific. And um, in our studies, to, I, I'm gonna now talk about studies from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. We think it's really important that, that, uh, that the T cells that a patient have has is, are different than what a, what a normal person has. And this is just an example in lymphoma patients looking at the CD4, CD8 ratios and some of those naive effector memory or central memory uh, phenotypes. And you can see how different the normals are from patients. So what we decided was uh, we think it's important what type of T cells you're making a car from, and so we actually make two cars. We make a car out of the CD4 cells and a car out of the CD8 cells, and then give them back in a one-to-one -one ratio. So we guarantee that we give the same amount of t different T cell subsets to each, each patient. Now I'm going to show you data in this first part of the study from the Hutch, and these are, this, this is a study called Protocol 2639 which we naively started about four years ago thinking that anything that expressed CD19 should respond the same way to a CD19 directed CAR T cells. So we, we included patients with CLL, NHL, and adult ALL. All of these cells expressed CD19, all the different histologies, and it turned out we were wrong, that each of these diseases actually behaves somewhat different in terms of the toxicities and, um, and, its, and the efficacy. So, but how do we do this? Well, this is shown here. We use a lentivirus, and remember, a lentivirus is the backbone of HIV that has all the HIV taken out of it, essentially. Um, and uh, and the uh, the uh, construct is shown is shown uh, here, where the there's a um, single chain FV linked to the the internal portion of a CAR T uh, of a T cell receptor with a uh, 41BB co-stimulatory domain. And a, at the very end, on the right side there, you can see there's an EGFRT. Well, what is that? That's actually a truncated EGFR receptor with none of the EGFR binding and none of the internal signaling. So now the T cells that we put our car into are marked. And they're marked, you can actually use Herbitux or any of the antibodies that can recognize the domain that's left, but it doesn't actually bind to EGFR, it doesn't signal, and it can be used as a very nice marker. Theoretically, it could be used as a suicide gene, so we could actually give an antibody and kill the CAR T cells using, uh, for example, an EGFR antibody. Um, this study was just about feasibility and uh, toxicity and figuring out the right dose, and there was no criteria based on uh, lymphocyte count, test expansion, circulating tumor, or prior transplants. So we have patients with aloe transplants, haplotransplant, cord blood transplants, We'll take literally anyone for this study. And I've taken patients with 100,000 circulating uh, lymphoblasts and 99% uh, marrow involvement, ANCs of zero. And we can actually get grow T cells out of most of these populations. So I'm gonna show you the first uh, parts of the study and I'll really focus on, on the lymphoma, but uh, we've treated now 180 patients, I think, or 185 patients on this, on this trial. Now, the, the important concept here is that this is a living drug. This is one dose of a therapy that then we hope persists. And this is an example of measuring the CAR T cells in the blood with that EGFR tag. And you can look at the percentage of lymphocytes that exist in the blood. And you can see it uh, at time zero. The cells are essentially homing. The, cell, the, the, the CAR is signaling the T cells when it engages the tumor. And then this leads to proliferation and cytokine secretion. And you can see the cells go up to almost 100% of the lymphocytes in the blood. And you can measure them in the lab. This is flow cytometry looking for the EGFR tag on CD4 and CD8 cells. And you can see that they greatly uh, expand in the blood, uh, which is shown in that upper, upper graph. This can cause tumor lysis syndrome. This, this can cause kilograms of tumor to go away in, in days or less and lead to all kinds of toxicity from tumor lysis, and then hopefully it'll, it'll kill the tumor cell and then lead to surveillance. 
but this can be with a significant toxicity. And here's an example from one of our first patients, 24-year-old with refractory ALL, had uh, about 90 plus percent, 98 percent bone marrow involvement with ALL. And you can see the fever curve is that red curve. And you, uh, she received a very low dose of cells, two by 10 to the fifth cells per kilogram. That may sound like a lot, but if you spun that down in a test tube, it's a little dot in a test tube, and that's administered in a bag of saline and nothing happens. And uh, I, I, we do it all as an outpatient now. And, and you can see nothing happened until day nine. Day nine, she developed a fever to over 40 degrees, and then a variety of things started uh, uh, going wrong. Uh, she, you can see that uh, her, uh, she became, uh, 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 her ferritin went up, her temperature stayed up, her CRP went up, her LDH went up from tumor lysis uh, syndrome. She became hypotensive, received uh, norepinephrine and vasopressin, as well as tocilizumab and dexamethasone. And uh, you can measure a bunch of cytokines in the blood. Those are interferon gamma, IL-6, and TNF are the ones that really go up. Um, and you can see right after the tocilizumab, uh, her fever went completely back to normal. So tocilizumab is an anti-IL-6 receptor blocker, and so this shows that the majority of these effects in these patients are uh, initially due to IL-6, and you can block that with tocilizumab and um, dramatically reverse hypotension. Her bone marrow was 98% ALL, and three weeks later she was in an MRD negative complete remission. So, I mean, when you see this happen, these are patients who have failed every single thing known to mankind, and you just go, my gosh, I have never seen anything like that. And in ALL, 94% uh, of patients had an MRD negative CR with CAR T cells. And that's been seen now across most studies in, in, in uh, adult and childhood ALL, with 80 to 90% of patients going into complete remission. Now, I'm going to switch gears back to lymphoma. Lymphoma doesn't work as well. Uh, the uh, response rates are about 70%, and uh, CR rates are in the 40 to 60% range. I'll just show you our first 41 patients uh, that we treated. Uh, you can see these all kinds of histologies, but these were heavily treated patients meeting of four prior regimens. 19 had failed prior auto or allo transplants. The, the rest of the patients, the reason they hadn't failed an auto transplant is they wouldn't even qualify for an auto transplant because they had completely refractory disease and didn't respond to anything. So they, they were not even transplant uh, candidates. Uh, when, you give, when you give this therapy, you give lymphodepleting chemotherapy first. Now it's, it's called lymphodepleting chemotherapy because that's actually what we're trying to do. We're trying to decrease the lymph lymphocyte count in the patient prior to us giving the CAR T cells. And what that does is it tells your body to make endogenous cytokines, IL-7, IL-15, and that actually makes a more welcoming, nurturing environment for the CAR T cells to then expand. And we tried this initially with just cyclophosphamide alone because that's what was used commonly in the past for TIL cell therapy. And we got good responses, but patients all relapsed. And then we added fludarabine. It turned out what was happening is that if you use cytoxin alone, patients all rejected their cells. So they made, they had a good response for about two weeks, and then they immunologically rejected the CAR T cells, and, and if you didn't eliminate all of their tumor, then they had a risk of uh, relapsing. Um, <clears throat> here's a, one of those examples. This is the very first patient we treated. One of my patients, refractory to everything, including an auto transplant, had grown right through an auto transplant. On uh, day uh, 28, uh, said he told me he felt like lymph nodes were melting in his neck, and uh, he was remarkably well, other than a fairly fairly significant uh, fevers. And uh, this was uh, this was quite encouraging. But what happened? He made an immune response, rejected his CAR T cells, and then progressed. We didn't know it was an immune response at the time, and I said, "Well, why don't I treat him again?" So I gave him another round of lymphodepletion and another round of CAR T cells. Absolutely nothing happened. So once you make an immune response. You can't give it again because your immune system is really potent at eliminating uh, uh, cells. So you have to prevent it from happening, and that's why it's key to give fludarabine-containing lymphodepletion. So that's the bottom line here. When we gave fludarabine, you greatly expanded the cells. This is looking at now the percentage or the absolute count of CD4 and CD8 cells after we gave fludarabine. You can see all those red curves are... Uh, are higher, and those are logarithmic. Uh, it's a logarithmic scale, so you can see those cells are like 100 to 1,000 times higher by giving fludarabine as lymphodepletion. There's a dose-related expansion of the cells. 
Uh, so if we gave two by 10 to the fifth versus two by 10 to the sixth, we got more expansion with a higher dose. And this has not really been shown before because and I think this is because we're giving CD4 and CD8 cells in a defined ratio. And the, the lymphodepletion improved the CAR T cell expansion and persistence. And this is because it causes greater levels of endogenous IL-7 and 15 measured just before the CAR T cells go in from the fluterbine. It's more lymphotoxic when you add that combination. And this was published in Science Translational Medicine just uh, last year. This leads to longer persistence of the T cells, longer duration of remission, and better responses. Here's a, just a couple of examples. Again, we had about a 70 to 80% overall response rate and about 40% complete remission rate in a variety of lymphomas. Here's a pleomorphic mantle cell lymphoma that, uh, that had relapsed uh, after an allogeneic stem cell transplant. This patient is in remission over three years after a single infusion of CAR T cells without any, uh, and this was after an allo transplant and had not had any increase in GVHD. So this, this is a really potent new treatment. Um, it doesn't cure everybody, um, but it, it is certainly a sub substantial uh, uh, component of patients that are doing uh, extremely, extremely well. We've shown now results in ALL, CLL, and NHL. In fact, the CLL paper, I think, just came out in JCO last week, um, uh, looking at about 24 patients for a brutinib refractory uh, uh, CLL. But what about the toxicity? This is not something you're going to do in, in a small center or in your office. Um, and the major toxicity of this is cytokine release syndrome. And this occurred in about 63% of patients. Um, it was mild to moderate in more than, more than half of them, but it was severe in four of these patients. And two died after higher doses of CAR T cells than we're current, currently using. Uh, the second major toxicity is this very strange syndrome uh, that results in CNS neurotoxicity. And these patients uh, uh, usually stop talking. And they, 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 su they suddenly stop talking. They have word finding problems. And this, if this is really severe, it can, it can uh, cause a, a very significant encephalopathy and lead to a coma-like state. And um, the, in worst cases, this can lead to a cerebral edema and patients actually can die. Now that's pretty low chance of that. It's in the two to 3% range which, uh, again, and these are patients who you would not expect to even have survivals in, in a one to two month range in many, many cases. So I think the, the, the toxicity is acceptable, but it is very challenging to learn how to manage it. And there is nothing we have found that we, uh, to, the, to date, that can treat the neurotoxicity. Now, now that said, it's, always, it's almost always self-limiting, 98% of the time. So, so we really just don't know what is important. And we usually give uh, aggressive uh, dexamethasone and corticosteroids to the severe, neuropo or severe neurotoxic uh, patients. Now, once you dial in the dose, the two by 10 to the sixth dose, you can see the relative, the risk of severe neurotoxicity, meaning are you gonna be in the ICU is only about one in 10 and neurotoxicity Grade three meaning um, compromised ability to care for oneself at about uh, one, in, uh, one in five. The people who get into trouble, who have severe uh, toxicity, are, are kind of get it right out of the bat. And so, so people who have fevers within a day of the CAR T cell infusion, that's the group that we now would, we admit to the hospital at the first fever, and we actually are more aggressive uh, at intervening. The neurotoxicity comes on about three to five days later than the CRS. So you can have the CRS completely managed with some tocilizumab or dexamethasone and then have the patient get neurotoxicity uh, later on. And nobody understands the mechanism of uh, neurotoxicity. We think it's actually from cytokines causing a vascular instability and endothelial cell damage um, that, has to, that has to resolve. So again, I've shown you this, the severe CRS manifestations are these early hemodynamic changes. In fact, you can actually predict who's gonna get CRS by just their heart rate in the outpatient. They're absolutely fine, the blood pressure is fine. They come in with a resting tachycardia of 120, and they're feeling fine, but they have a tachycardia of 120, and that's a, a sign they're usually gonna develop CRS. Um, they can develop a coagulopathy, and we watch this real caref carefully if patients get a consumptive coagulopathy, and they may need increased transfusion requirements. There is, in severe cases, a risk for hepatic or renal dysfunction, and we can measure, we, we now can do a, a, day, a daily uh, IL-6 level at, at the University of Washington and monitor their CRP and ferritin. 
So I'm going to conclude our trials here that this uh, has absolutely potent anti-tumor activity and B-cell malignancies. Uh, this defined, a, defined composition approach, meaning CD4 and CD8 cells, uh, I think uh, facilitates a better dose response and dose toxicity index. Uh, we've shown that transgene immunogenicity can be a problem and uh, needs to be, if you optimize lymph depletion, that improves it. And we can, do the, we can do better in the future. We might be able to give different schedules of second infusions. We might be able to, we're, we're already doing combinations with a PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitor antibodies. And if we early, can early detect the CRS uh, before patients get into trouble, we might be able to block it. Okay, there's three companies out there making anti-CD19 CAR T cells that are going to be approved for diffuse large B cell lymphoma before the end of the year by probably one or two of them. The first one, the farthest along, is KITE, and this is KITE uh, uh, CD19, and this is data from the Zuma trial. This was presented at ASH, ASCO, and then most recently at Lugano, Switzerland, at the lymphoma meeting. Um, uh, uh, this is axicaptogene cyalucil, uh, uh, and I can't even say it, and I'm, I know the field, um, and good luck with this one. But uh, this is based on uh, the um, data I'll show you from the SCHOLAR-1 trial where they just took patients with refractory large cell lymphoma and said, treat, treat them with anything you want, what's the response rate? And the response rate is a CR rate of 8% in that setting, and median survival was around six months. And so this was the population that the KITE trial uh, was studied in. Now this is different than the CAR I showed you. It has the same single chain FE, still binds to CD19, but that second signal uh, is, um, is CD28, not 41BB, okay? It's a different co-stimulatory domain, and that makes it a, a, a different product, and it behaves uh, differently. So this was their study. They, 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 there was a phase one and a few patients, and then the phase two had two cohorts, refractory large cell lymphoma or primary mediastinal lymphoma, refractory, uh, or transformed follicular in a smaller population. The primary endpoint was the objective response rate in the first uh, 92 patients uh, dosed with obviously duration of remission, survival, safety, and levels of CAR T cells and cytokines. Uh, this are the patient characteristics. These, were, these are, these are uh, patients with bad disease. They're not bad patients. These are patients with bad disease. You can see um, patient, there were quite a few patients over uh, the age of 65. Um, um, these are uh, ECOG performance uh, limited to one, uh, and you can see prior, uh, greater than pre prior, three prior therapies in uh, uh, 60 to 80 percent of patients. Most of these patients were refractory to second or later line uh, therapies, and some had re relapsed within 12 months of an auto transplant. Uh, so that, these are, this is a very uh, poor uh, risk group of patients. So what's, what's the bottom line? The, in the large cell lymphoma group, 82% overall response rate, 49% uh, complete remission rate, um, uh, yeah, about the same, a little higher complete remission rate in the uh, transformed folliculars, which we think respond a little bit better, and the primary mediastinal uh, B-cell lymphoma. So in, in a series now of 101 patients, you can see 80% response rates and 50% CR rates. Um, this is uh, the duration of the response now early on with 8.7 uh, uh, months of follow-up. And you can see that the, the group uh, with the CRs, that's shown in green, are doing pretty well. And at last analysis, I think they've had no relapses in the, in the, um, in the group that achieves a CR and gets out to about a three to six month uh, remission. And it's about 40% of patients uh, appear to be long-term uh, disease-free and maybe cured by this, by this approach, even in the absolutely refractory uh, disease setting, which is just astonishing. Again, this is a place where no patients would even be able to qualify for a transplant because they have ref, uh, refractory disease. And this is just now throwing it up against that uh, overall survival curve of the Zoom, uh, from the SCHOLAR-1 trial, suggesting that this is uh, better. And um, uh, in terms of uh, toxicity, it's a different product than the one I was uh, telling you about. Uh, the uh, patients did have uh, grade three and greater adver adverse events. Uh, cytokine release syndrome of grade three or greater was seen in about 20% of the patients, and neurotoxicity, again, seen in about 30%, um, but very few fatal events 
uh, in, in, this, in this study. And the, uh, uh, so 43 percent of these patients did require treatment with tocilizumab and 27 percent uh, received steroids, uh, but no, uh, no actually drug-related adverse events. Now, um, I'll just uh, come back to this. So this, uh, the big news as of, I think, Tuesday of this week, week was that the FDA said that they did not need uh, to present to an advisory panel and that the FDA had all of the information needed to make a judgment as to whether they would approve or not approve uh, this product. So that could, uh, could come any time between now and uh, I think the end of November. So this is very, very exciting. This is very likely that this will be commercially approved uh, for patients with uh, refractory uh, large B-cell lymphoma. But it, it, it is a new therapy, obviously. It's one of the first times the manufacturer will have to be in the loop for every single patient because you'll have to collect cells, send them to them. They will then send back cells to the center to be treated. These are patient-specific, ult ultimate patient-specific uh, therapies, and it'll only be done in a small number of centers uh, throughout the United States, at least initially. All right, what about the next product? This is the Juno product, JCAR-17. Uh, it's very similar to the one I was telling you about in, uh, at the Hutch. Uh, it has a, a 41BB co-stimulatory domain, and they're putting them into the isolated CD4 and CD8 cells and giving back a mixture of, uh, essentially even mixture. Uh, this was reported uh, at uh, ASCO and Lugano uh, by Dr. Abramson. And uh, the groups are uh, very similar, although they included ECOG-2 perf performance patients who did not actually do very well in the study. Uh, but you can see there's, they, this is very similar to what I showed you with the KITE trial. Uh, they uh, went through a, a dose escalation period and pick, picking a dose level two in, uh, in, in, in vials. Uh, they had a very similar 72% overall response rate and 50% uh, CR rate which seems to be holding up very nicely at uh, the three months rate, very similar to what I just showed you. They had a couple of very fascinating cases they presented at ASH. At ASH. There was a case that had developed a big CNS mass in between the screening and when they actually were ready to go get treated, and, they, and this had been an exclusion criteria for all of our trials. They appealed to the FDA and said, you know, can we give the product? They actually gave the product and this mass in the brain resolved. And so we have now treated quite a few people with, um, not with primary CNS disease, but with a leukemic meningitis or lymphomatous meningitis, and, and you can get complete remissions in the CNS without significant increase in toxicity. Um, and, and in line of some of our other comments recently, one patient had a relapse of disease that they biopsied, and by the act of biopsying the lymph node caused re-expansion of the CAR T cells and the patient went into a complete remission. So there may still be this, this immune manipulation or target, uh, you know, inability of the T cells to actually get into the target that's still gonna be important. So that's why these, th this is all one big story with the checkpoint inhibitors and, and your immune system. Um, now, uh, it seems like the Juno uh, uh, group is showing a lower toxicity in terms of neurotoxicity and, and grade three, uh, four CRS. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, it's obviously still uh, early on, and they're just expanding this now into, uh, into their phase two trial. Uh, these are the durability of the responses and, uh, in their core population. All right, the third uh, group that has CAR T cells uh, for diffuse large B cell lymphoma is Novartis, and remember Novartis is gonna get approval likely for childhood ALL and young adult ALL up through at least age 25 based on the data they just presented to the uh, the, to the advisory panel. Uh, that was voted on 10 to 0 in, in favor of approval, and it's likely the FDA will uh, uh, deal with that in the, next, uh, in the next month or so. This, again, is kind of similar to the, the Hutch pro this product I just showed you. It has the same single-chain FV, recognizes CD19. It has a 41BB uh, co-stimulatory domain, but it's put into all T cells. It's not put into selected CD4s or CD8s. And, it, and it's given at slightly different uh, doses. This was uh, presented um, at, uh, at Lugano this year for the first time. Uh, they uh, had a little bit of a fall off in between enrollment and treatment. They actually didn't do the study, I think, in the smartest way. They just said you could be collected, and then they would, they would try to grow T cells. But what they found was they couldn't grow T cells enough for all the demand, and so they ended up 
a lot of patients died before they could actually produce product. And so this is really one of the, ex exemplifies one of the problems with the field. These are, it takes somewhere between probably 17 to 30 days to be able to produce cells by all three of these companies. And uh, it's gonna be really important that they can do it in a, in a regular uh, and reliable fashion and that there'll be enough slots available to be able to do this. So all these companies are gearing up to be able to make these custom products. But they reported on 85 patients that they treated. Uh, 51 had uh, been evaluated for response with uh, three months of follow-up. And uh, they got a slightly higher dose, and, but a flat dose of uh, around 3.1 times 10 to the eighth cells. Uh, response rates uh, were very similar, 60% overall response rate, 43% CR rate. And those CRs seem to be pretty durable. Again, just same story in that 30 to 38 to 40% uh, response rate. Um, they, and this is just their relapse free at, um, <clears throat> at six months for patients who had uh, responsive disease. Um, there were uh, the usual uh, issues with cytokine release syndrome, uh, some neurologic events, uh, tumor lysis syndrome in one patient, uh, no uh, deaths related to the drug. The management uh, for the CRS uh, shown here, 24% of these patients did have to go to the ICU. Uh, so this is, again, this is an aggressive therapy and, and you have to be really able to do this. And it's a wild ride, I can tell you, for, and, and, and it's gonna be a very slow rollout into, into uh, uh, smaller centers, and it should be. Um, but again, this is incredibly encouraging. This is one of my last slides. So here's how I compare these uh, three different products kind of head to head. There are differences between the Kite, Novartis, and Juno products. Uh, the kite cells are made out of C with a CD28 uh, co-stimulatory domain out of bulk T cells. Uh, the Novartis is also the same way, and the, the Juno is in selected subsets. You can see um, that uh, the study populations were quite similar, uh, and but the response rates and the overall response rates and CR rates appear to be quite uh, 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 similar. So this is incredibly exciting. It's, well, I think it's the biggest advance we've made. Uh, in a long time in lymphoma, probably since rituximab, uh, and then this one represents one of the one of the new treatments. So I'll conclude here: a high response rates in ALL, CLL, and NHL. Multiple companies are likely to get approval uh, with their cars. Um, the response rates appear definitely better than historical standard of care using the Scholar One trial. Longer duration is needed, um, but there's a lot of logistic difficulties here. Um, the production needs to be reliable. Distribution needs to be worldwide. Treatment needs to be done in advanced centers. And you have to be able to manage uh, severe toxicity. But we're getting better at it. And the, the toxicity is definitely going down. But this represents a new treatment option that didn't exist and will likely move up. There's already talk of doing this front line for childhood ALL at high risk. And so, and so if you, you know, this is, that would be a revolutionary thing if you could eliminate the bulk of the chemotherapy uh, in this. Lastly, this is the Bezos Family Immunotherapy Clinic. I'm happy to be the director of this new clinic. This is dedicated only to giving cellular immunotherapy. We have about 12 different CAR T cell trials or CAR T cell or TCR or TIL cell trials that are opening. This is just cellular immunotherapy, not including checkpoints and all the other parts that are truly immunotherapy as well. This is just cellular immunotherapy and it's really, really exciting. We have room to grow. So I will stop there. Thank my colleagues, uh, Cameron Turtle and Stan Riddell especially who Help, uh, help me do all these trials. So thanks very much.